Hey everybody and welcome to Relationship Refresh. We are in our week four of this, session four, and um, and I hope this has been beneficial to your relationship. Um, you know, this is one of those things, any relationship is very biological, you know, it's one of those things that you kind of get out as much as you want to put in. Think of it like working out your bodies, right? I mean, the only way that your body will become stronger, your body will become, um, you know, more of what it was meant to be is really through hard work. And, and so, as we are moving through these things, um, everything that is being given to you are like tools in the tool belt. Um, these are the things that, that can help you in constructing um, the best marriage, the best version of marriage that God has intended uh, for, for you. Uh, but the only way that tools work is how. You use them, right? I mean, if I was going to try to build a house on my own and I had all the tools and I just decided, meh, I'll just use whatever I got around, right? It's not going to be a very good house. Uh, but if we use the tools given to us um, and the more we use them, the more familiar we become with them and the better the thing we're building is. And what we want to build here are strong relationships, strong relationships. And, and what we're going to be talking about here in session four is um, absolutely one of the benchmarks of a healthy relationship, and that is the ability to seek and to grant forgiveness. All right. Um, a few scripture verses that I want to I want to throw your way. Um, and these are a little uh, larger chunks, so bear with them here. But the first one's Ephesians 4, 26 to 32. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He says, be angry but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Be angry, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Then in verse 28, it says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come from your mouths, but only such as it is good for the building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, but let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Put it away. Get rid of it along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. The key part, I say this almost at every wedding that I ever perform, and that one of the greatest things that I could wish upon any couple, any relationship, is that, that they would have a relationship of grace, where the things that have been given to us by God would be freely given away to, to the others in our family or the person we are in a relationship with, because that's really where it all comes from, that, that this crazy gift of grace that has been given to us in Jesus would then our response to that would be crazy, awesome obedience as we give away what's been given to us, right? That God is not a grudge holder. God's not up in heaven keeping a tally mark of all your sins and, and holding them up one day so he can just and tell you everything you've done wrong. But God in his grace actively forgives us. And so Paul says, likewise, you need to be quick to forgive one another, to be tender-hearted and kind, because that's how God is towards us. And then in Matthew, Jesus says in Matthew 18, 15 to 20, he says this, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell them their fault between you and them alone. If they listen to you, you've gained back your brother or sister. But if they do not listen, then take one or two along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If they then refuse to listen to you, now go tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to the church, then have them basically be cut off, is what Jesus says. 
Verse 18, he says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I get, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Again, here Jesus is giving us a divine statement. This is divine obedience, that if there's a grievance between you and another person, that you have the spiritual obligation, take it to them personally. You don't take it to a third party. That's called triangulation. Triangulation will always hurt a relationship. That's when A talks to B about C, and C doesn't know that A talked to B, because A doesn't want to go talk to B, so they talk to C, and it's just a mess. So especially in a marriage relationship, if there's something going on in the relationship, bring it to your partner. Don't just go talk to your mom about it, your dad about it, your sister about it, your friend about it, or whatever it might be. You go talk to them personally. Now, if they're not willing to hear you, and it's something substantial, then bring in others to really say, man, this is important to me. I want to talk about this, right? But, but otherwise, Jesus says, this is how I've designed this thing to work. And then he says in verse 18, he said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, the power of forgiveness, that God has given us the power to set loose the sins of others, that they don't bind to us, they don't hold to us, they don't hold us down. And then Colossians 3, one of my favorites, Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Again, this is, this is Paul talking about radical obedience, a radically awesome life lived through the identity that was given to us by Jesus. And he says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. If one of you has a complaint against another, forgive them as the Lord has forgiven you. You must now also forgive. And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another with wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What sets Christians apart from the rest of humanity? What sets us apart? I think there's a number of things, but really at the heart of what makes a Christian a Christian is the fact that we have been given unbelievable grace from God, who instead of punishing us for our sins, punished his own son, so that through that son who died and rose again, we might have a brand new life where the things given to us by God, we now can freely give away to others. The rest of the world holds everyone accountable. Just look at the language that's used today. When you watch the news and you listen to others and you read social media, I mean, people are bad mouthing people left and right. Nobody's watching what they say. I mean, Paul said, let no malice let no anger, or slander, or bitterness, or wrath come out of our mouths, but only what is encouraging and building up. Now, some of you might be sitting there like, how is that even possible? I mean, come on, how is that possible? Man, I'll tell you what, with your own strength, absolutely not. But with the strength of the God who lives in you by his spirit, it's absolutely possible. It really is. Because anything else is sin. Anything else is going to harm the relationship. And Jesus wants your best relationship. He is for you, not against you. And that's why he is teaching us. He's discipling us on how best to love and forgive others. Now, with this in mind, I want to bring in 
a great tool that has helped me immensely. I use it in a lot of counseling. And it's written by Gary Chapman, who also wrote The Five Love Languages. He wrote a book where um, basically his premise was this, is how do people give and receive forgiveness? Have you ever been in a situation where something's happened in your life or someone's done something to you and they apologized for it and then you, in your mind, you were kind of like, I don't believe you. Like somewhere in your mind, you're like, I don't know if that was a genuine apology. What Gary Chapman would say is that in that moment, those two people are not speaking the same forgiveness language. And, and, uh, and he says there's really these five distinctive languages that people use in order to speak through this. And, and so I'm, I want to go through sort of a summary of the five apology languages that Gary Chapman lays down in his book. And if you want a lot more on this, just make sure, just go to Amazon, buy the book. It's The Five Apology Languages by Gary Chapman. A great read. But this is what he lays down as sort of the five key languages. The first one is this, expressing regret. It says, for most people, an apology is not really an apology unless they hear the words, I'm sorry. For many of us, in order to truly forgive, we need to see that the person who has injured us regrets what they have done. This is the most essential of the elements of an apology, but some people feel it's more keenly than others. Expressing regret. This one is really the emotional side of things. They want to see that the person feels bad. I'm truly sorry for what I did, right? They want them to feel Maybe how they felt, right? That, that, that is the first language. The second one is the accepting of responsibility. We can, uh, this one says, we can all find good reasons and explanations for why we behave badly. Um, like she was pushing my buttons or I was running late or she hurt my feelings. But whatever the reason, it doesn't change the fact that what we did was wrong or hurtful to another person. While this element of an apology is similar to expressing regret, many of us also very much need to hear admission of responsibility. Someone could say, I'm sorry I hurt you. But in many cases, it's important for us to accept responsibility for having caused the hurt. I was wrong to yell at you, or I'm sorry I spaced out while navigating. That was my fault. Sometimes expresses the most sincerity. A accepting responsibility... If this is your language, the one thing you do not want to hear at the end of an apology is the word, but. I am so sorry I hurt you, but if you weren't running late, I never would have done that. Just negated the apology, right? Because they're not truly accepting of the responsibility, right? So if that's you, now the reason I get a little fired up, this one's mine, all right? Secret, right? But that one's mine, accepting responsibility. That word, but, just negates the whole thing. When people are like, I, yeah, I'm really sorry, but, you know, I was running late and traffic was crazy and all that. It's like, nah, eh, right? And so accepting responsibility is the second language. The third one is making restitution, um, as they explain in the book, they say this, that sometimes just expressing regret and taking responsibility for our actions is not good enough. Sometimes we need to make restitution to make an apology sincere. A great example is when a child swipes a toy from another kid. Uh, we don't just encourage the child to apologize. We also encourage the child to return the toy that was stolen. But when you hurt a family member, a friend, a spouse's feelings, restitution isn't about returning something that was stolen. It's about reassuring the other person that they are loved. So this is the one where it's, it's not just the, the saying, I am sorry. It's now going a step further and saying, like, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to make amends for what you did? For some people, this is saying, I don't want this to happen again. What are plans that you could make so this doesn't happen again? right? Especially if this is a repeat offense. It's like, yeah, you apologized for this two weeks ago and it happened again. I want to know how this isn't going to happen again. What changes are you going to make in your life so that you don't hurt your family member, your friend, your spouse in this way again, right? If somebody has a drinking problem and they, and they drink really heavily two weeks ago and they hurt somebody and then it's like, well, I'm so sorry about that. You know, that, that was, that was crazy. And then two weeks later it happens again. And two weeks later, at some point you have to sit and go, 
or I think something around the drinking needs to change or whatever it might be. It could be stress at work. It could be how we're handling the kids. It could be sports or TV or our device. It could be anything that causes us to want to hurt other people. But then the change, the restitution needs to be made. The fourth one is genuinely repenting. Chapman and Thomas remind us that the word repentance means to turn around or to change one's mind. So an apology loses its sincerity if you give your loved one no assurance that you're not going to try to make that mistake again. So this one really goes into not just making the amends, but now it's, it's I'm going to do this for you now, and then here's the behavior I'm going to change down the road so that we'll have success. This is the plan. And number five is requesting forgiveness. Now this is crazy because what they found in their research is for many people, they need to hear the words, will you forgive me? And then the words, I forgive you. I think that is astounding that God has wired many people to react to that. They want to hear those words. That might be you. But those, were the, those are the five languages. Now, um, if you go online to, on the app or on GDLC Church and you get the resources for this study, you're going to find in there an apology language quiz, all right? And, uh, and it's going to be very simple. I think it's 20... 20 um, questions. Again, go with your gut. You kind of move through them. And this profile is designed to help you discover your apology language. Now, there's other resources where you can get way more honed in. This will give you a good head start on it. So you read through these 20 hypothetical scenarios, and then you check one of the responses that you would like to hear. And then at the end, you're going to tally up the different um, the different shapes that are there. And that's gonna give you kind of a head start. My advice would be that each of you in the relationship take this little quiz and then talk to your partner about it. How did it, how did you score? How did it come up? Another way you can get at what your language is, is in what situation have you found yourself saying, I don't believe you, right? When an apology doesn't seem real, that can help get you there as well. Okay, so that's the quiz. Now, as you go through this, the next step, once you actually understand what your apology languages are, now comes the skill of actually seeking and granting that forgiveness, okay? And so you're also gonna find online um, steps to help seek and grant forgiveness. Um, and this is so important because in, in the process of forgiving one another, uh, I like to think of it as a bridge builder, as a bridge builder. It's someone that's going to go to that other person. Like Jesus said in, in Matthew, he said, he said, if your brother or sister sins against you, go to them. See, we aren't those that just sit around and are like, well, if they really were sorry, they'd come tell me about it. No, that's not how this works, right? I, I like the definition of bitterness is this. It's, it's you drinking the poison, hoping they die. That's bitterness. Bitterness, it, it only ruins you, right? I remember a story one time when, uh, when I felt like I always had, to, there was this particular friend I had and I always was like, I'm the, always the one that has to call them. Like, why don't they call me? And it was starting to get kind of like, eh, you know, and you get kind of bitter about it or whatever. I'm like, you know what? I'm just not gonna call them. I'll see how long it takes. What was really funny is it took like, I don't know, maybe a month and I was really stubborn and I was really frustrated. And I realized, finally I gave in and I called my friend and the friend, hey man, what's going on? I'm like, that didn't bother that person at all. Who was being bothered by that? Me, right? I drank it. I drank the bitterness. So you don't want bitterness in a relationship. All right? Now, what this says here, and this is a great quote. I want to share with you this quote. And this is from um, the Gary Chapman website, but they said this is a great quote. It said, the road to restoring love and intimacy in your marriage begins by seeking and granting forgiveness. We all blow it at times. And so we must be quick to make amends when we do. Keeping a short account with our spouse sets up the stage for a flourishing marriage. And at the heart of our own salvation lays the willingness of one greater than us to forgive us. So how much more then should we be willing to follow suit and be imitators of Christ when we have been given so much in the way that he's forgiven us? 
It's when forgiveness abounds that reconciliation happens. Forgiveness does not violate the rights of the individual who is wronged, but it frees the offended from harboring sin. When we seek to understand how we have been hurt or have hurt another, then we are in a position to empathize with them and allow forgiveness to heal. So when you are wrong, be bold enough to admit it and then allow forgiveness to heal the wounds of the offense. Forgiveness may be afforded to those who have wronged another, but it's truly merited by repentance. Sometimes the road to forgiveness can be long and painful, but the end of the road is restoration and godly communion with one another. I thought that was so beautifully written, right? Forgiveness is hard. It's gritty. It's not easy. But forgiveness is not just for the person you're forgiving, it's for yourself, right? When we hold on to unforgiveness, it, it's, it's like chains around our very soul. You know, I think, of, I think of the story in scripture when Jesus talks about the unforgiving servant who comes into the king with this billion dollars worth of debt. And the king forgives this servant, sets the servant free from all their debt. And what does the servant do? The servant goes out and finds the first person that owes him a little bit of money. And instead of forgiving that person as the king forgave him, he chokes the guy out, throws him in prison, like, you're going to pay me back all my debt. As he was doing that, the king's servants see him doing this, report it to the king. And the king's like, you have got to be kidding me. Go get that guy. Brings the guy back in. And it's like, how dare you? I just forgave you like a billion dollars worth of debt. And you can't forgive this other person a few thousand dollars? Are you serious? And then it says the king threw that man back into prison, put the debt back on his head, right? Jesus says after, right after he teaches how to pray the Lord's prayer, he says, if you forgive the sins of others, your sins are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness, God withholds forgiveness from us. That's in scripture, right? Forgiveness is a big deal. Harboring unforgiveness is is not good for you for uh, for anybody spiritually, right? In that parable Jesus told, we are the ones who were forgiven the billions. The forgiveness we offer to others is they might owe us a few thousand bucks, right? Does it hurt? Is it money? Sure. How does it compare to how God forgave us? Not even in the same ballpark, right? So God says, I want you to take the radical grace I've given you. I want you to go give that away to others. And the, and the place it starts, the place it's most pivotal is in our relationships. So pivotal, so pivotal. So you're going to find a handout that's called Seeking and Granting Forgiveness. And it's just going to give six steps for seeking forgiveness and six steps for granting forgiveness. The six steps for seeking forgiveness are admit what you did was wrong or hurtful. Try to understand or empathize with the pain you've caused. Take responsibility for your actions. Make restitution if necessary. Assure your partner you will not do it again. And I would say if your apology language then is make a plan, that would be make a plan. Number four would be make a plan. Number five, apologize, ask for forgiveness. And number six is forgive yourself, right? That is seeking forgiveness. The six steps for granting forgiveness is acknowledge your pain and anger and allow yourself to feel disrespected. It's okay to, that you're hurt. It's not okay it happened. None of this is saying it's okay it happened. All right? We're just not going to allow that pain, that wound, to fester and get infected and cause greater harm than if we deal with it now. That's what forgiveness is. Deal with it now while it's more manageable. So acknowledge the pain and hurt. Be specific about your future expectations and limits. Give up your right to get even, but insist on being treated better in the future. Let go of blame, resentment, and negativity toward your partner. Communicate your act of forgiveness to your partner. And then work towards reconciliation when safe. Now, I want to say this. This is important. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. These are different. Reconciliation 
takes two to tango. It's two people coming back together, admitting wrong, empathizing with one another, forgiving one another, coming back into a restored relationship. Forgiveness can be given to another person even when their character is not going to change or their person is not going to change. You might have someone in your life that you've had a relationship with um, and you're no longer with them and maybe they're never going to change. Their life is never going to be different. Well, we hope it will, but you know, that person can still be forgiven. Meaning you can, you can set them free from your soul. That you don't have to think I'm going to get even or, or I want revenge or I want them to hurt as I have hurt. You got to let that bitterness go. Let the anger go. Right? So it's still okay in those situations to grant forgiveness. You're not saying what they did was right. And you're not necessarily seeking a restored relationship but you can still offer forgiveness, okay? Again, this is one of the most pivotal aspects of who we are, and it's going to be really important um, to understand your apology languages. So make sure you go take the assessment, read it through, share that with your partner. Um, and this seeking and granting forgiveness has been powerful for a lot of people, and you'll really find some areas where you might have some hangups, some areas where you're sitting like, ah, that's what I've been doing, that's what I've been doing. And in all of this, remember, on your own strength, this is not possible. But if you rely on God's strength, all things are possible. So pray to God, say, God, give me the spiritual strength to forgive as you have forgiven me. May this bless all of your relationships and I can't wait to see you for session five. We'll see you next time.